This is the Kyle Fled Show on the New Talk Radio 1450 WCTC and WCTC AM.com. The voice of Rutgers football. The Kyle Fled Show is a weekly one hour program with the new Scarlet Knight head coach. Now, let's go live to Brother Jimmy's Barbecue in downtown New Brunswick. Here are your co hosts, former Scarlet Knight player Eric Legrand and the voice of Rutgers, Chris Carlin. Ah, yes, we are preparing for the postseason once again. Welcome, everybody, to the Kyle Flood Show, live from Brother Jimmy's in downtown New Brunswick. Chris Carlin, Eric Legrand, and the head coach of the Scarlet Knights, Kyle Flood, joins us as he does each and every week. How are you? Uh, great to be here. Another uh, another great night at Brother Jimmy's. Nice to see the place on a Monday night. Uh, yeah. A lot of things going on here. we got pro basketball, NBA basketball, Monday night football coming up here with Rex Ryan. So a lot of exciting things happen. One of the McCourty twins as well, oh, Jason yeah. McCourty. I believe the new father will be uh, on the field uh, in just a little bit. And maybe J-Mac can get, get an interception like D-Mac did the other night. That would be, be nice. nice. Been what? staying busy, Coach? Well, it's very busy this time of year, as you know. we got, we got the bowl game to get ready for. We've had some official visits. We had a junior day, and the coaches until this Sunday were out on the road recruiting. So now – Everybody's back in house, and we tighten it up a little bit and, and get back into game mode and start really the real preparation for Virginia Tech. You know, this is almost like a, a little bit of a second season. And let's take a step back for a moment. Go back. When you came out of the Louisville game, it was obviously not the result you wanted. It was a tough one to be sure for this group of kids. How long do you did you feel like it, it took to get that one out of their system? That that was a tough game, and, and you know, as I've said before, I felt like you know, for myself and for the, for the players in the program, it was almost like, almost like having your heart ripped out, and, yeah. and it, was, it was hard. And I think it probably took us as a program all the way till Sunday to get that one out of us, our system, and really it took us until we had another game, something else to set our sights on. Until that point, you're almost left with nothing else to do but think about that. And, and as coaches, we move on pretty quickly, and we actually had a player – commit to us after the game in my office yeah so you know we have to turn the page pretty quickly but i think it's a little bit of a different experience for the players you know as they're on campus they're in the dorms they're in their apartments and they're and they're around the fans and the other students and a lot of people that want to talk about the game and tell them how bad they feel for them but really what it does it just keeps bringing it up yeah. and until you have something else to set your sights on it it's hard to move past it i didn't think as a program we had moved past it until Sunday. Yeah, how important do you think it was to get those players off from Thursday until that Sunday to just clear their minds from football? I think it was important. Again, you know, 12-game regular season, uh, a physical season. You know, we certainly were dinged up like most teams are at that point, and I think it was good for the players to have a couple days off their feet and just to kind of regather themselves physically. And then even after learning of our opponent, we didn't practice until the following Saturday. Now, we did lift and run with mm. Coach Cole, so – it, um, I'd be hard pressed to say the players were off, you know. But that's true. But you know, we did not actually put the pads on and practice again until that following Saturday. Well, you can be a part of the show tonight. We're here until nine o'clock at seven three two five four five nine two eight two. Give us a call on fourteen fifty WCTC and on our vision. You can also tweet us questions at our football. You can send us a question on Facebook as well at facebook.com slash our football show. So there are a lot of different ways. For you to get involved tonight, and we would encourage you to do that. Get an opportunity to talk to the coach as Rutgers get set for the Russell Athletic Bowl coming up on December the 28th down in Orlando, and they will face the Virginia Tech Hokies, an old foe from years ago when they were in the Big East. Last time these two teams met was back in 2003. But, Coach, uh, first of all, before we get to Virginia Tech in just a little bit, let's talk about the last few weeks. And I think one of the more underrated factors of going to a bowl game and and probably coaches appreciate it a lot more than the fans do but how important these extra practice times are for the younger players in your program absolutely critical and a huge advantage for, for the bowl eligible teams that are fortunate enough to have this block of time the way it has worked for us and, and not that this is the way everybody would do it but you know with the academic responsibilities our players have and needing to give them the opportunity to finish papers and get ready for finals when we did the calendar we felt like we had 14 opportunities to practice and some of those practices really are just developmental practices where we we take out the non-travel players we take them out to the field and even guys like leonte Carew, who play a little bit for us in the game are able to come out there now and really work at the wide receiver position and have the total focus of the coaching staff be on them and i think that when you have those types of situations and you take advantage of them the right way 
it really gives your oppor- your program an opportunity to springboard itself into the off season and into spring practice. How important is it to have the game be in December 20th instead of like a bowl game on December 15th, and then after that you can't really get any more practices in as a team for the 2000 for the future season. So how important is that to you know later in the season to have basically the practices? You're you're right about that. I remember the one year we went to the St. Petersburg Bowl. That was the one year the bowl game was before Christmas. 19th. Yes. Yeah, yep. and I and. That. That really put us in a little bit of a crunch, and we weren't, as a- we weren't able to have as much of the developmental time as we would have when it's after Christmas. And I think all the other games have been at some point after Christmas, or I remember going to Toronto the one year, I think it might have been January 4th or 5th that year, yeah. where it really it seemed like it was almost like two springs that we had to get ready for that one. But the, you know, I think when it's some, sometime between Christmas and New Year's, it, that gives you a good amount of time to, to both allow your players to finish academically strong and then really gain some extra time or steal some extra time for the younger players in your program. I'll throw this in, by the way. He had a sack in the St. Petersburg. Yeah, board. I did remember well. that. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, um, let's talk about some of those younger guys. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of them a few weeks ago to the media. Who, who has really kind of jumped out? Who has really impressed you during this period? And is this for them almost like a second training camp? Uh, it, it, is a, it is similar to a second training camp. The only difference would be the install meetings and that type of deal. But fundamentally, it's like a second training camp for sure. And I, you know, I think in their own ways, just about every one of them ha- has shown me something. I'm very pleased with this freshman class. You know, I think some guys are maybe a little bit further along than others because they've been practicing with the travel squad. A guy like Leonte Carew is practicing up. Mm-hmm. So you know, he's, he's, he might be a little bit further along than some of the other receivers. But... You know, even guys like Ruhan Peel and Carlton Agadosi and, and Ian Thomas, uh, I'm very, very pleased with, with the way they look out there running around. A guy like Julian Penix, you know, he really, he has really flashed, you know, in these practices. And I think he's got a very, very bright future for us. A guy like Davon Jacobs had an interception today, has had some big hits. Uh, Javon Tyree has had some big hits, you know, in this developmental practices. So, uh, you know, again, I'm leaving some guys out, but I think in, in their own way, they've all flashed at, at one point or another. And it really won't be until the spring when we mix them in with the older guys to, to set the depth and compete for jobs that we really can see who's going to move into that first team or one and a half you know, next season where they're rotating in. Now for the travel squad, do you give them off or let them come out and watch the practices or are they inside lifting getting ready? Uh, we, they, are, they are lifting on the same days we do the developmental practices. We did actually have one day last week on Friday where the travel squad had already lifted four times that week, but we had a developmental practice Friday where – you know, I didn't tell them that they had to come out, but about three quarters of them were out there watching and, and coaching and, and really enjoying them. So it was a little bit like the old Sunday night football. Yeah. Uh, when the older guys would stay out after the <laughs> Sunday night practice and watch the scrimmages. Well, you know, we talked about this a few weeks ago when you had all the freshmen here at Brother Jimmy's for one of the shows. And uh, the idea that during the season, it's a tough time for them if they're red shirting. So is this right now getting that chance to, to practice more at their future natural positions? Is this, I guess, an exciting time for them? I think it's exciting, and I think it's also very educational because it's, it's one thing to, to be a part of a practice and kind of have your role. It's another thing to be the focal point of the yeah. practice and to have to take just about every rep and go through the drills full speed and all the eyes are on you all the time. You know, it's a much more taxing situation, and I think some of these younger guys have learned how hard it is to practice at a high level through the entire duration of practice like a guy again i can say you know one of the best i've ever seen logan ryan as good a practice player and by that i mean as as high performing a guy in his preparation as i've ever seen probably the he and jeremy zuta in my mind were always the two guys that jumped out to me when i watched them practice at because they practice at such a high level all the time so now when do you think you stop the developmental and turn into the game preparation full game out mode for this virginia tech team Tomorrow's that day. You know, tomorrow's tomorrow's our first official Virginia Tech day, and we're going to go tomorrow and then Thursday and Friday because of the way the final schedule was. A lot of the older guys have finals the following day. So Wednesday we're actually going to have a developmental practice mm-hmm. because there's not really a, a heavy workload for the younger guys. We'll bring them out there one last time. That'll be the final developmental practice. But tomorrow will be the first official install, and then Thursday, Friday will be two and three. Players will be off Saturday. We'll travel Sunday, and then we have our regular game week when we get to Orlando. Our first tweet of the night comes from Gary Kochar, and it's somewhat related to this because when you have as many seniors as you do on this team, it's a good question. So when you talk about these younger guys, what are you going to do next year 
when you lose as many of these clutch, talented seniors as you're going to lose to graduation this year? I think that's the beauty of college football. At college football, you have a different team every year, and, and everybody goes through the same thing. And you recruit every year to build the depth in your program, and then when you get to spring, you got to sort it out because, you know, really by the time you get to training camp, you don't have a lot of time left to sort it out. You know, you have 15 practices in the spring. We do it over the course of five weeks. You know, but, but again, to me, that's one of the, the great things about college football is that every year your team is different. It's unique. And you got to find out who are the guys in your program that can, can make the plays on offense, defense, and special teams and make sure you put them in a position to do that. And as these seniors graduate, how hard is it, you know, as your first year as a head coach, keeping them focused on this one last game that they have and not looking forward to the future as much and staying focused as this last game is to come up? I think we've done a good job of that over the years. And I think when you win five bowl games in a row, you wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't do a good job staying focused on the bowl, on the bowl game. And I think this year our team has a, a very unique opportunity, you know, an opportunity to win ten games, which would be only the third time in the history of our program that we've been able to win ten or more games in one season. So I think the seniors – have taken a lot of pride in that in, in trying to achieve that goal and everything i've seen from them so far has been very focused well it is a unique opportunity to be sure but all you know you, you touched on it there a little bit think about the fact that this is a chance to win six bowl games in a row for this program going seven out of eight years and uh, just going back through some of these games you know there's really only been one or two close games Rutgers has really dominated when it has come to the bowl season over the last several years. When you look at that and the success in the bowl games, how much of it do you think benefits from the fact that you have the time that you do to prepare for it? I think there's definitely a, a preparation piece you know, to that puzzle. I, I think here also it, it's always been very important to us that our goal is not to go to bowl games, it's to win bowl championships. Right. And, and we talk about that from day one. You know, this is an opportunity to win a championship. And any time you get an opportunity to win a championship, you better take that very seriously, and I think our players do. And now as the weather is going to be down there in Florida, it's going to be a little bit nice. Do you know, transition to practicing more in the bubble now and turn the heat up in there, or do you still go outside with it? Uh, we've been practicing in the bubble, you know, uh, during bowl prep. And, uh, and then when we get down there, you know, like we'll have three good days out there, you know, outdoors in, in the heat. And I think we'll get accustomed to it. I know the Florida guys are looking forward to it oh, yeah. on our team, for sure. I know I will be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Caleb Johnson and uh, Juwan Jameson and D.C., et cetera. You know, so they're looking forward to it. But, uh, but, but I think we'll be ready. I think we're in good shape. I think Coach Cole and his staff have done a good job of maintaining our conditioning level, you know, keeping it a high level, you know, through the bowl prep. Well, we're going to take our first time out in just a moment. We'll get your phone calls in. Get on the phones at 732-545-9282. You can also tweet us at our football or Facebook. You can leave a question on our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash show. And I was remiss earlier in not mentioning that if you're here in attendance at Brother Jimmy's, you can also come up right up front, see our man Patrick, and get a question in for the coach. We will get you on camera as we are live on our vision as well as the new talk radio 1450 WCTC. Let's take a break. Stay with us. From Nelligan Sports, this is the Kyle Flood Show. For over 20 years in New York City, Brother Jimmy's Barbecue has been serving up great times as well as some of the best barbecue this side of North Carolina. And now Brother Jimmy's is opening in downtown New Brunswick on the corner of Easton Avenue and Wall Street. We are the official provider to Rutgers football and are proud to announce who will be the 2012 host of Coach Flood's weekly radio show every Wednesday night. So come on down to Brother Jimmy's and put some south in your mouth. For reservations and... <laughs> They'll see you before you see them. Cops are cracking down on drinking and driving. Drive sober or get pulled over. John was the best big brother I could ever have. John was also my best friend. I could never have been more proud of John as I was the day that I saw him graduate from the Naval Academy in Annapolis. When I found out about John being killed, it was the worst nightmare that I could ever imagine come true. John was my hero. And now it's our chance to be a hero to others by being a designated driver. Off 
any silver jewelry and 55% off anything else through Christmas Eve. Choose from a selection of thousands of hard-to-find jewelry items in both vintage and contemporary style, including cameos, pearls, watches, and even breathtaking diamond jewelry at below wholesale prices. Stop in and browse at National Estate Jewelers and pick up a free bottle of jewelry cleaner while supplies last, and there's no purchase necessary. National Estate Jewelers, family owned and operated since 1962 and open seven days a week for your shopping convenience. Located at 212 Route 18 North in East Brunswick, just off exit 9 of the Turnpike and next to the FedEx office. Call 732-257-GOLD, 732-257-GOLD, or find them on Facebook. Happy Holidays, from National Estate Jewelers family to yours. Now back to Brother Jimmy's Barbecue in downtown New Brunswick for more of the Kyle Flood Show on the New Talk Radio 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Once again, here are your co-hosts, Chris Carlin and Eric Legrand, along with Rutgers head football coach, Kyle Flood. We will get into Rutgers, matching up with Virginia Tech and the Russell Athletic Bowl coming up in just a couple of weeks. We take your questions. We can take them on Twitter. At our football, we can also take them on the Facebook page, our football show as well, and at 732-545-9282. A couple of more things about the last few weeks. When you look at um, some of the position, I don't want to say position switches yet, but you were taking a look at some guys at different positions. One that comes to mind, Marquise Wright, maybe on the offensive line. What have you seen from those guys over the last couple of weeks? And who have you been looking at in different situations? Well, we did we did take take a look at Marquise on the offensive line for about four or five practices now, and we've really been pleased with what we've seen. You know, I think he's a big, athletic guy. He's uh, he's actually taken to the position a little quicker than I would have anticipated, and he's been able to get in there and, and take reps and not have mental errors, which which is hard to do, you know, in the very beginning at, playing at the guard position. And I think he's somebody who's going to give us depth going forward and, and have an opportunity to compete for starting jobs. So I think. He, I think he's found a home there. And then, we, you know, we, we took Jeremy Deering, and, and we've been doing some individual work with him in the secondary, not knowing quite yet the status of Brandon Jones, although he's look, Brandon has looked better and better. But just in case, we, you know, we need to have him back there at safety, we wanted to make sure from a technique standpoint he would be ready. You know, I think from a scheme standpoint he'll be ready for, from what we did earlier in the year. But we wanted to make sure, you know, physically he'd be ready to go. And, and he's looked good doing that as well. And, and then he would flip back and forth during the team periods. Now, when you see these guys transitioning in these developmental periods, how do you think they'll transition going into the spring now and into this offseason, getting ready to play these new positions? I think it's an advantage right? because now as they enter the spring, they've already done it. You know, they're not going out there and spring. A lot of times you make these decisions in, during winter workouts, mm-hmm. and they really don't have an opportunity to, to be coached you know, the way they can be coached right now. So I think for a guy like Marquise Wright, it'll give him an opportunity to compete faster you know, than maybe some of the guys who've done it in the past. I, I remember – you know, Antoine Lowry moving over, a guy like Desmond yeah. Wynn moving over. Yeah, and I think we did those during training camp. And, and that's really hard you know, to, to win a starting job doing it that way. But, uh, but doing it now, I think will really give Marquise an opportunity. And, and if ultimately that's where Jeremy ends up in the secondary, I think it will give him a, a better advantage as well. And, Eric, from the player's perspective, I mean, you did it midseason. You're moving mm-hmm. from D-line, fullback, linebacker. You're kind of all over the place there. How much uh, – how difficult was that to do during the year – and would it have been more beneficial to, to kind of find it your way in a period like this? Well, it would definitely would have been more beneficial back then if I could find it in a developmental period. But you're a true freshman but as, at the exactly. time. Yeah. But, you know, the athlete came out, and I was doing, you know, a little bit, doing my thing out there, but I'm just playing. But the, the <laughs> I, remember, I remember being I know, on the I offensive know. staff when no. we moved Eric to fullback, and I think there was some sleep deprivation involved there with the coaches on the That team. is definitely <laughs> the hardest part, learning the plays <laughs> mid-season when you have to transition to, are right, you going from defense end to defensive tackle. Now they move you into fullback, and you're lining up in, in trip sets with Tyquan Underwood and Kenny Britt, and you're motioning over. These are the hardest things that I had to learn, transfer from defense to offense and learning different terminology. And as you get to do this in the developmental period now, you can practice it more, you can see it more on film. It's definitely easier than doing game preparation, getting ready for this, and being able to play the next week as you get moved into a new position. Let's get a phone call in. Our first of the night is Mike from Cedar Grove. Mike, you're up in the Kyle Flood Show. What's going on? Hi, guys. How's everything going there? How you doing, Mike? Good. Hey, do you guys mind taking a question about the Louisville game, or are we only talking about the ball game? Go ahead. Shoot. Coach, on the 
fake field goal that resulted in a touchdown that was called back by that officiating crew. Did you guys look at it closely, or did you hear from the conference whether that was a, uh, a correct call by that officiating crew? I think the Big East Conference officials do a great job. Yeah, they do. <laughs> But on that call, did they do a good job on that call? Well, I think, you know, if you have a TiVo at home and you have an opportunity yeah, to look at do. it, it'd probably and be interesting to do that. Yeah, okay. Thanks for the answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> Mike got his answer without getting his answer necessarily. Mike's trying to get me fined before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Grinch calling in. <laughs> that money's going to go toward presents. Come on. Well, I, how about this? You can't say it. I will. I'm still looking. I'm still looking. Anyway. Let's get into some of the other topics around this team. And, you know, I'm kind of interested in the development of this team as a whole. The guys that are the younger guys that are going to play factors here the next couple of years, but that are big factors right now. Are there guys where you have seen really big development during the season to where maybe back in training camp you're still wondering, you're asking yourself questions about what's this guy going to be and – he got under the lights and all of a sudden really answering the question in a big way. You know, I, I think I can point to, to two freshmen, and, and they won't be the only ones that we'll talk about, but I think I would start right away with a guy like Darius Hamilton. Yeah. yeah to be able to come in as a true freshman, and, and I don't put any expectations on, on any of the freshmen based on their recruiting status because, to me, it's not always, there's not always a, a natural correlation between the two. Everybody's career advances at its own pace, so even though you might be highly recruited, it may not happen so quickly for you when you get on the field and you play, but for Darius it has. And he has been able to play a lot of football for us and match up against a lot of offensive linemen this year, giving away 30, 40, and 50 pounds at different times of the year and really play at a high level. And I think as he gets bigger and stronger going through his career, he's going to be fun to watch over the next three years. And I think the same could be said of a guy like Leonte Carew. He's really, really done a nice job in these developmental practices, playing receiver, attacking the football He's just such a strong athlete. It's very hard to outposition him on the football field. And you see that right now on special teams where it's played over really long distances, wide spaces. But I think when you get a chance to see him play a little bit more receiver next year, people are going to be really excited about what they see. I want to go back to talk about a little bit about Marquise right now playing guard. How important do you think it is of Antoine Lowry making the decision to come back? How much can he learn from him watching him play another year under basically play, dominating the offensive line and leading the anchor in them? I think, you know, I think for, for, for Marquise, he's got a lot of guys, you know, ahead of him right now that he can look at and learn from. And, and I, I really, I said this before, and, and I was talking about Jeremy Zuta and Logan Ryan, but I think the most important thing a young player learns is how to practice and how to prepare. You know, a guy like Darius Hamilton being able to learn from Scott Vallone, you know, not only how to practice, but how to prepare in the classroom. And it'll be the same for Marquise to have guys like Caleb Johnson, Antoine Lowry, Batim Bajari, RJ Dill, Taj Alexander, Andre Civil, you know, those type of guys to learn from, learn not only how to play and perform, but more importantly, how to prepare, because that ultimately will determine how well you perform. We've got a question from a young man who's here in attendance at Brother Jimmy's. Sir, what's your name and where are you from? Matt from East Brunswick. Hey, hey Matt. Matt. Hi, Coach. Hi. Uh, I won the tickets uh, that That's I took right. to the Louisville game, and I appreciate it. I was able to take my fiance and her sister, so I really appreciate you guys doing that for us. Absolutely. Um, we'll be Already the- trying to score some points with the sister-in-law. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll be in the stands in Orlando, so really excited about that. Congratulations on a great season. Appreciate it. Um, I know that during bowl practice, one of the big advantages of having the extended practice time is allowing some of the younger players to get more reps that they normally may have not gotten during the season. Um, can you talk about some of the players that, you know, based on these bowl practices, have shown you something during the practices, some guys that you thought have been doing a nice job? Yeah, the developmental component is critical, and we touched on a couple of these things before, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another example. You know, a guy like Chris Muller, a guy like Derek Nelson, you know, two offensive linemen that are on the scout team for most of the year and and even during different weeks are trying to run an offense like Army's offense, which is completely different than what we do here. You know, really exciting to to see those two guys perform because, you know, I I think as we go into spring, I I can, not that I would rule anybody out, but I I would feel comfortable saying that those are going to be two guys that are going to be competing, if, if not for starting jobs, which they may be, but certainly to be in the depth and in the two deep or maybe be the third tackle, the third guard, the second team center, whatever it is, they're going to really have an opportunity to move themselves up the depth chart based on what I've seen this, uh, this offseason. 
Real excited for the game, Coach. Let's get 10 wins, all right? Thank you. I appreciate that. We'll see you down in Orlando. By the way, for those fans that haven't made their plans yet, make sure you go to RutgersBowl.com. Check out the travel packages. Get on the uh, flights and get down to Orlando. Maybe a little uh, sun in the holiday season mm -hmm. wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to it for yeah, certain. I hear you. Um, we need you to be involved as well at 732-545-9282 and tweet us your questions for Coach Flood at our football. Okay, so you're going to be facing Virginia Tech in a few weeks, or in, well, what, about 10 days now or so. Mm -hmm. um, this is a team that 6-6 six and six, uh, wins over Georgia Tech, a very good Duke team this year, a uh, rivalry game. They beat Virginia. You know, tell us a little bit about Virginia Tech, what you're expecting to see with Frank Beamer. You know, I think that the first thing that you have to talk about when you talk about this particular Virginia Tech team is their quarterback, Logan Thomas. Mm -hmm. and, and he is the prototype NFL quarterback, a projected first-round draft pick, really has all the measurables of a Cam Newton. And he's their leading rusher on their football team. That's high praise. It is. And I think when you, when you see him out there performing, he is a physical specimen. And, and he's going to be somebody that we're going to have to get a lot of people to, to to make sure we get him on the ground. But he's a talented passer as well. You know, so, you know, I think they're running the ball for about 158 yards a game, uh, if, if my memory serves me correct. So, you know, they're, they are committed to running the football. And, and they throw it well enough that they're going to create big plays if you – if you're not on point in your coverage. So I think they're offensively, he's the focal point of what they do. And then defensively, you know, they're a pressure outfit, and they do it a little bit differently than we do it. It's really schematically not the same, but I think they value the same things we value on defense. I think they value speed. I think they value making plays in the background, in the backfield. They're certainly not a bend but don't break defense. That's not how they approach it. They're, they're going to be they're going to be an attacking defense and they're going to be going forward all the time. And as you said, Logan Thomas is you're going to need one more than one player to take him down. Does that allow you to bring more pressure as a defense and go more attacking and instead of a bend and don't break defense as you said Virginia Tech is not? Well, you you know our defense, and if I told Coach Smith we weren't going to pressure, I don't know if he would come to the game. <laughs> so, so I don't think that'll be an issue. You know, but this uh, but, you know, but this week. And in this game in particular, I think it'll be important that as, as we pressure, you know, once, the, once the runner is defined, that everybody goes break foot, dry foot, and, and they get to that ball. Mm -hmm. Here are the numbers on Logan Thomas this year. 2,783 passing yards, 17 touchdowns, 14 picks, and then the rushing yards, 528, but nine rushing touchdowns in the season. That's pretty impressive stuff. And he's a load. He's yeah. a big guy, and, and they, they have a little bit of a gun. 260, they list him at. Well. it's a big man. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and he looks every pound of it. Uh, Coach, when you take a look at Frank Beamer and his history at Virginia Tech, you know, it was funny because when you look back at where Virginia Tech was, it was kind of similar to when Coach Ciano first came to Rutgers to where Frank Beamer went to first uh, to Virginia Tech. And the program that they have built – They've played for national championships before. What is it about Frank Beamer that has allowed to have them to have the success that they have over the years? You know, it really was a, a thrill for me to, to get a chance to meet him. And you know, the active wins, uh, the active wins leader right now in Division One yep. football, and twenty straight bowl games, and all the other accolades that that you talked about. He really is somebody that, as a young coach coming through this profession, hoping someday to have an opportunity to be a head coach that I always looked up to. And ironically enough, the guy who gave me my first full-time coaching job, Joe Gardy, he worked with Joe Gardy at Maryland years and years ago. So really? it actually was a Joe Gardy connection to Frank Beamer. I believe it was Joe Gardy, Frank Beamer, and then um, the former coach at, at Virginia Tech. I can't. At Virginia Tech? Or? Yeah, at, 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 I'm sorry, at Georgia Tech and then Maryland. Georgia Fregion, Tech. Oh, Ralph Fregion. Fregion. Right. Yes, okay. the three of them were on the same staff down there at Maryland. and So it really was a thrill for me to meet him. And... I think one of the things you can point to, not knowing, I, I wasn't here at Rutgers when we were playing Virginia Tech, so I, I, sure. I, can't, I can't give you any, any feedback on that. But the one thing I know that they've always had there is tremendous staff stability. You know, a lot of his coaches have been with him for a long time. And when you have that kind of stability on your staff, it, it creates consistency, continuity, and not just continuity in the football, but continuity in recruiting and understanding the system and the culture that they have there. And I think all those things are in place. They help you to have the kind of success that they've had. Now, how important, we know both teams take pride in their special teams. Huh. Greg Greenberg and you know, Rutgers football. 
how important is it going to be? You know, that's going to be a huge advantage or disadvantage for a team to take the opportunity to either block a punt or kick returns or kick offs. How much is that going to play into this game? I think it's. I think it's going to play into the game. There's no doubt. And I think the team that is able to get out in front of that a little bit is going to have an advantage. And I think you're going to see two. Uh, two programs that are going to be very aggressive on special teams mm -hmm. in terms of trying to block kicks and, and return for touchdowns, those type of deals. And uh, we know we're certainly going to do it, and we fully expect them to do it as well. And it's something that he has always preached as well. They call it Beamer Bowl mm -hmm. down there, and they, they had a, a reputation for a long time, still do, of being a team that likes to block kicks. How about the defensive side? Uh, they've got a stout group, to be sure. They do, and, and, they're, and they're very good up front on defense and at the linebacker level. They're a little bit bigger than most of the teams in our conference. You know, I think they run well. Uh, they do play a fair amount of man-to-man -man coverage, and, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to take advantage of that with our receivers. You know, but they are, they are going to attack you uh, on defense, and they're going to be going forward, and we're going to have to make sure that we're on point, you know, being gap sound in the run game and then being sound in the protection so that we can take advantage of it on the outside where – you're going to have one-on-ones and you're going to have opportunities. And I, I don't want to say they're daring you to take them, but you're going to have opportunities. And the more you make of those one-on-one -on -one opportunities, the more chances you're going to have to score. And as you said, their linebackers are a little bit on the bigger side. Do you find that as an advantage or a disadvantage as the offensive line going up versus them being able to use your quickness and speed versus their stoutness? And you said they can run around too. So do you find that a little bit difficult for the offensive line to get by and be able to block them? I don't think so. I don't think either one is any more difficult or, or easy, depending on the size. I only point that out because that's what they, that's what they look like to me. Mm -hmm. I think it always comes down to executing your system. You know, for us, you know, I make the statement sometimes a, a little bit sarcastically or, or uh, in jest that, you know, I, I, hope we, I hope we can hold up this week because we're not very big on defense. Well, you know, mm -hmm. we're the number four scoring defense in the country, so I think, I think we hold up pretty well usually. But... You know, but that's because it fits in our system and the things we value. It we've always valued speed over size at Rutgers, and that's how we play defense, and that won't change. And for them, they're a pressure defense, but they do it a little bit differently than we do, and they are a little bit bigger than we are on defense. I don't know if that'll be an advantage or a disadvantage. I, you know, again, I think we're going to be big enough to block them. We just got to make sure we execute. Thirty-two sacks is here for their defense. They forced nineteen turnovers on the year, and the total yardage. Uh, 24th in the country so i mean they obviously have done some very good things on, on that side of the ball this year and coach foster he's he's one of the, the premier assistant coaches in the country and and has coached a lot of great defenses over the year years and, and somebody who again has his system it's something he believes in it's something they recruit to year in and year out and even despite graduation every year they seem to feel the defense that's always going to be competitive We'll take a timeout right now. We'll come back. We'll have more of an opportunity to get your phone calls in at 732-545-9282. If you're here in attendance at Brother Jimmy's, come on up, ask the coach a question. See our man Patrick in the front. You can also tweet us questions at our football. We'll get into the development of some of the offensive players for Rutgers during the course of the year, including the quarterback, Gary Nova, coming up in just a bit. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue is the official barbecue provider to Rutgers football and is your home for all things barbecue, sports, and fun. Let's take a time out. Stay with us. From Nelligan Sports, this is the Kyle Flood Show. When you shop an electronics big box store, do you feel like cattle? When you ask a question, do the salespeople look uh -huh. dazed and confused? Thought so. When you need a digital camera, come in and visit Unique Photo, New Jersey's only camera and video superstore. For over 60 years, customers have counted on Unique for price, quality, dependability, and service. Call 1-800-631-0300. That's 1-800-631-0300. Or visit us online at uniquephoto.com. Uniquephoto.com. Unique Photo. We're all about you. Investors Bank is a proud sponsor of Rutgers Scarlet Knights football. With branches throughout New Jersey, we're here to help you with all your personal and business banking needs. Investors gives back to New Jersey's communities visit one of our branches and experience the investors difference for a branch near you call us at 855 i bank for you that's 855 i b a n k number four u or visit myinvestorsbank.com that's myinvestorsbank.com member fdic silver 12 we crash silver 16 six back hole <laughs> Well, Jim, he really iced that one. Down cold. He cracked open that end zone smooth and easy. When you enjoy every game with the cold, refreshing taste of Coors Light, you've made the perfect play. 
call is illegal hands in the cooler. Er, illegal hands to the face. Refresh! He's at the 24, the 18, the 12, the 6, and he's in! Look at those moves! My goodness! Yes, Jim, it's refreshing to see... Coors Light is the world's most refreshing beer, and with its super cold activation, you'll know right when it's cold enough to drink. Get your cold, Coors Light, eh? And... I'll take one right here, please. Hey, me too! This season, reach for the cold every single game, only from Coors Light. It's cold! Man, I'm thirsty. With great beer comes great responsibility. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Enjoy football Sundays with 250 Coors Light drafts and bottles at the Fireside Grill, Main Street in Marlboro. Coors Light, every game's a reason to celebrate. Now, more of the Kyle Flood Show, the weekly hour-long program with the head football coach of the Rutgers Scarlet Knights on the New Talk Radio, 1450, WCTC, and WCTCAM.com. Let's go back to your co-hosts, Chris Carlin and Eric Legrand at Brother Jimmy's Barbecue in downtown New Brunswick. I tell you, we're trying to squeeze in the eating during the break. A little bit. I'm hungry. Not easy to do at Brother Jimmy's because <laughs> the bites are pretty big, my friends. I'm the food you. is so good, it's not easy not to do <laughs> As good as it gets. If you haven't been down here yet, just opened earlier this uh, football season. It is a terrific spot. They've got big screen TVs everywhere the eye can see. And I'll tell you, the food is second to none. Here at Brother Jimmy's, the official barbecue provider to Rutgers football and your home for all things barbecue, sports, and fun. Some great French fries, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, sweet potato fries. Yeah. Try that, too. Okay. Not bad. All right. Let's get, a, let's get a phone call in here. Kyle from South Plainfield is up next on the Kyle Flood Show. Kyle, what's going on? Uh, hi, guys. I just had a question for Coach. Uh, I just wanted to know, obviously, when um, a new coach takes over a team, it's, it's tough on a uh, all the players, the coaches, and it affects everybody. And I just wanted to ask him how much the success that he had in his first year, how, how much did that help you guys in the team? Because obviously it's a big change, and in your first year you already won nine games. And like like the caller said before, it doesn't matter what the rest said on that play. If we go up one three, I think you win that game. So, you know, in my eyes, you definitely deserve the coach of the year. That you got. Well, I appreciate that, and I think – you know, certainly when you're fortunate enough to have success and have success early, there's no negative to that. I think it helps everything. But, you know, really from day one before we even started playing games, I felt like that the most important thing that happened was that the seniors and the leadership of the football team really bought in and really believed. And I think the greatest example of that is their ability to get on the same page with a new coaching staff, you know, nine assistant coaches, Coach Smith obviously was on our staff last year in a different capacity, and then eight different coaches from eight different places. And to be able to get on the same page with them it, as quickly as they did, I think speaks very highly of the type of teachers and communicators that the coaches are, but also the type of listeners and the type of people that the players were. And you know that, that, is, not an e- that is not an easy thing to do, and, and I felt getting the job the most important thing I did was hire the staff because those were going to be the nine people – really responsible on a day-to-day basis for for coaching and teaching and and molding this team and i think it speaks to those nine guys and the and the leadership of the team being able to to do that and do it as quickly as they did thanks for taking my call i just wanted to say for eric you know just keep chopping and i can't wait till next friday yeah you know it man thanks kyle for checking in and you know i was remiss earlier I should have introduced him as the Big East Coach of the Year, okay, Kyle go, Flood. Okay. I appreciate that. Absolutely. There we go. Maybe you could come home tonight and say that as I go in the door. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we should talk about some of uh, your players who have garnered some honors, and we have to start with Kasim Green because it seems like every other day I'm getting a press release from Jason Baum or somebody mm. who's telling me he's All-American this, he's All-American that. He's the two-time Big East Defensive Player of the Year now. Uh, Coach, when you when you look back, and I know you still have one more game with him, but when you look back at his career, I mean, what, what is it about him that has allowed him to become this kind of special player? I really, I, I would start by saying I think he deserves every one of them. And really one of the, the premier playmakers on defense nationally and somebody certainly in our scheme that, takes advantage of every opportunity that he gets you know I, I think the most exciting thing I could tell people about Kasim Green is that he's his learning curve is still on the way up yeah. he's just completing his second full year playing linebacker and, and I I really believe that he's going to continue to get bigger 
He's going to continue to get stronger and faster, and he's going to be a better player at the next level than he is right now. I think that's the most exciting thing about his game. Yeah, and I'm we're fortunate to get to watch him one more time. I'm going to praise him a little bit because I remember him when I came in with him as a freshman and where he was as a player. Now he was a safety, and he wasn't really getting anything. You know, he wanted to play right away, but then he had the red shirt. Then I remember living with him the year I got hurt my junior year and how much he matured and was just ready to learn anything that the system was throwing at him and how much physically bigger he got and how much physically – gifted he was over other players and how it's turned out to be so i gotta give him some kudos for that he's been amazing to to be sure and um we'll mention one a couple of other guys obviously Duran Harmon again uh first team all big east and scott Malone, first team all big east and you know what it's about time because that that's not a one-year award that's something yeah that's something that could have happened easily two three times for scott Malone. yeah i agree and i think he's played at an all-league level for a long time and and I couldn't be happier for him to see him get recognized in that fashion. And I would have been really disappointed had he not been, only because every week, you know, we have our head coaches' conference calls, and and I listen to what the other coaches say to see kind of how they evaluate what we're doing. And I don't know that there was a head coach in our league every week when they were getting ready to play us that did not mention Scott Vallone. So he's a as disruptive a guy as there is in our conference, and I think everybody we've played has felt the same way. You better you better put two people two people on him every player he's going to be in the backfield and being a good friend of him a lot of people always ask me how how is he going to do it in the nfl he's not that big he's not that big i'm like, or that big or that fast i'm like he could play football he's a technician out there he knows the techniques and that's how he really uses that to his advantage as you can see him doing his dips and rips or getting over the getting over the offensive lineman he's really a great player he's going to be a big asset for the nfl whoever picks him up I think you're right about that, and I think even earlier in the year, people got to see how versatile he really was because Isaac Holmes was playing great football for us at that point. We moved him over to the three technique, and he was every bit as productive playing three technique as he had been playing the nose. And one guy that should have been first team all Big East, the middle linebacker, Steve Bullharness, and he played at a terrific level all season long. And, you know, Kasim had the huge numbers next to him, so maybe that's why he got a little bit overlooked, but it had nothing to do with his production and the way he played for this team this year. And as, as excited as I was for Scott getting that award, I was as, I was as disappointed at Steve kind of being left off that list. And you, know, you were at our team banquet. You know, he was our defensive MVP this year, and Kasim Green was the team MVP. You know, but what, I, and, maybe, and maybe you have to be a part of our program to really understand how valuable Steve is, but, but he is the guy at all times who's, making the calls, making the adjustments, and then fitting into the scheme. And a lot of times fitting into the scheme and sending the ball to guys like Kasim Green, Lorenzo Waters, Deron Harmon, et cetera. But he does make his fair share of plays as well. And then on third down, he puts his hand on the ground and rushes the passer and has been a very effective doing that for us. And how hard is it to replace him after he's been doing it for so many years? You know, I, in college football, unfortunately, at some point you got to replace them all because you can't sign them to another contract like you can in the next league. But, uh, but it, it's going to be hard. It's going it, to—he's going to leave some pretty big shoes to fill for, for one of these younger players, wh whether it's a guy like Quanzel Lambert who ultimately does it, or you know, possibly a guy like Kevin Snyder moving into that position, or maybe somebody that we've recruited this year. You know, we'll have to—we'll figure all that out in the spring. But those are going to be some pretty big shoes to fill, no doubt. And you know, I, I think back to his career. Whenever you needed the big play on defense, mm -hmm. it was either him or Kasim. And a couple games come to mind. Last year at Syracuse, uh, in, a, in, a, in a gutty win down the stretch when Steve came up with a big interception. I, I think about this year at Cincinnati. I believe it was at Cincinnati this Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Drop back into coverage, same thing, big interception. And, I mean, there is something to be said for that guy that you know at that moment you're going to be able to rely on to go and make a big play. And I have no doubt in my mind that, you know, as you know, as I look, as much as I look forward, you know, to Steve playing in this bowl game and getting an opportunity to see him play in a Rutgers uniform one more time for us, you know, when he does move on, he'll be playing at the next level. He will be playing football in the NFL at the middle linebacker position, and and there's no doubt in my mind about that. He will have a place in that league. As knowing Steve, I don't know who he's saying. Let all you know may not get all the accolades and everything, but let the real experts and the real people figure him out and know what he can do on that film. Yeah, the people, the linebacker coaches and the defensive coordinators and the head coaches in that league, when they start looking at the film and they see him at our pro day combine, whatever, and then really when they start interviewing him and they really realize how much football that guy does know at this early stage of his career, he's going to be very valuable to them. 
Got one question on Twitter for you, Coach. This is from RU Nighttime uh, re in reference to bringing pass pressure. Without repeated linebacker blitzes to win, how do you do that against Virginia Tech? Is that something you need to do? I'm a little off on the wording there, but... I think everybody's got their way of, of getting to the quarterback and getting pressure on the quarterback. And, you know, some teams ha have elite level one-on-one -on -one pass rushers and, you know, and other teams do it with a pressure package. And we've always been more pressure package oriented here. That's, that's the way we've done it. And that's the way we've gotten, I think, you know, even in the last game, unfortunately we came up a little bit short as a team, but in the, in the limited amount of throws that they had, we sacked the quarterback three times and pressured him a couple other times and, I think it was once every nine attempts we sacked him and we hit him more than that. Yeah. So, you know, we get to the quarterback and sometimes it's with man coverage and sometimes it's, it's zone coverage and you have to be able to mix those. But like I said, every team's got their way of doing it. And, and even though we may not do it with just a straight four down rush all the time, I think you have to have the ability to do both. And when you see when you say those pressure, talk about how important it is for those defensive backs, especially when they play man to man. How important it is to ha hold their man for sometimes more than five seconds because the pressure has to get there, the play has to develop. Talk about how important that is for the defensive backs and how big of a role they play in those pressure packages. It is, and in man coverage, it's critical that they stay disciplined and keep their eyes on their luggage, so to speak. <laughs> and, and sometimes for longer durations than others. And, you know, we, we hope it's no more than three seconds, but you're right. Sometimes it is a little bit longer and teams max protect and they, and they do that type of stuff. So you have to be ready to do that. And also when you got a safety like Deron Harmon in the middle of the field, sometimes you know, he can come out of the middle and make a play. And the one that sticks out in my head because it's on all the highlight films was on the sideline against Arkansas. The guy catches the ball and Deron kind of separates him from the ball oh. as he hits him. And mm -hmm. it's an incomplete pass because of a great play by a safety. Well, we'll take one more time out. More of your phone calls when we can at 732-545-9282. And more of your questions on Twitter, at our football. Stay with us one more break. From Nelligan Sports, this is the Kyle Flood Show. Homeowner, did you know a burglar can break into your home and get away in just five quick minutes? A locked door may not be enough to keep a thief out of your home. Think about what you can lose, then think about this. Now you can get a free security system monitored by ADT, the leader in home security. Pick up your phone now and get free hardware, free medical and fire alert, and free activation. That's an $850 value. Just call Protect Your Home, your authorized ADT dealer at 1-866-588-8167. You'll get 24-hour protection. And there's no cost for parts or activation. Call now about a free security system monitored by ADT. Call 1-866-588-8167. $99 installation charge, 36-month monitoring agreement at $35.99 per month. Call for terms and conditions to this offer and protect your home license numbers. Call now, 1-866-588-8167. Once more, that's 1-866-588-8167. New Jersey Today, it's two-way talk hosted by Burt Barron. Join me weekdays from 1 to 3 for your daily dose of Jersey news and events, Jersey lifestyle and entertainment, Jersey politics, and of course, Jersey people. We don't just talk about the top Jersey newsmakers of the day, we talk with them. Check out the only show that brings the Jersey attitude, New Jersey Today. On the New Talk Radio, 1450 WCTC and online at WCTCAM.com. Yeah, it is the man cow. And New Jersey, I love you. I mean, really, I now hold still. I want to put my tongue in here. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, that's love, right? Well, since my tongue can't really travel through every speaker into your ear, I'm going to give you four hours of unconditional love every weekday afternoon from 3 to 7 in the form of me, the man cow. you got to check it out. The new Talk Radio 1450, WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Did I make you feel dirty? What? Now back to Brother Jimmy's Barbecue in downtown New Brunswick for more of the Kyle Flood Show on the new talk radio, 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Once again, here are your co-hosts, Chris Carlin and Eric Legrand, along with Rutgers head football coach, Kyle Flood. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, it is the official barbecue provider to Rutgers football and your home for all things barbecue, sports, and fun. Got a couple of minutes left in our final show here at Brother Jimmy's. We will have a show down in Florida the night before the game on the 27th of December. 
between 7 and 8 at the Shingle Creek Resort. Ray Lucas will be by, as will Anthony Fusilli, and Coach will be by for a segment as well. So we'll have a show. Keep that in mind. If you're heading down to Orlando, we'd love to see you in the lobby of the Shingle Creek Resort on December the 27th. Now, in getting ready for this game, as you prepare, I mean, we talk about the keys all year, but when you look at the Virginia Tech team, what are the things that absolutely concern you the most outside of what we talked about with Logan Thomas and their defense? I think, you know, I think defensively you have to minimize his effect on the game. And, and you know that he's going to run the football a certain amount of time, and you have to make sure you get people there to tackle him. But like I said, they have a, a kind of read option or a read zone aspect to their offense. So you're going to have to play assignment football as well. You're not just going to be able to run everybody at the quarterback. That's, they don't allow you to do that, which is smart on their part. And, and I think offensively, it, it'll be very simple. It'll really come down to us executing against their pressure. And that'll start up front you know, in the run game and in protection. We have to make sure we're putting hats on the right people. And if we can execute up front, in the run game and in protection, it'll give us opportunities. It'll give opportunities for, for guys like Juwan Jamison and Savon Huggins at the second and third level. It'll give opportunities for guys like Timmy Wright, Brandon Coleman, Mark Harrison, Karan Pratt, et cetera, you know, on the outside. But on offense, it, it'll be very simple. We need to execute against their pressure. Knowing what Logan Thomas can do on the offensive side of the ball, does that mean that you want to keep him off the field as an offense and try to get, you know, maintain the ball more, more running the ball or – trying to get the you know, little short pass instead of going deep and trying to score right away. I don't think about that early in the game. I think as you get into a game, sometimes there's a place for that mentality. You, know, you try to minimize the possessions that the opposing offense may have, but I don't really think about that at the beginning of the game. I think early in the game, you've got to execute your offense, and if that means you score on the first play like we did against Louisville, I think that's great, but there's a lot of football left to play at that point, obviously. Uh, but I think... It, at all times, you're trying to execute, and, and if those balls can go in the end zone, you, you let them go. That's first 15. As a head coach, how do you handle this trip now? Because not only is there obviously a job to be done, but there is a reward in getting to go and play in a bowl game. It is, and I think that the, the bowl game experience is really a, a reward for everybody. It's a reward for the players first and foremost. Uh, but also for the coaches and their families. You know, and you have an opportunity to take your families to a great city like Orlando and, and everything that city has to offer I think is tremendous. And, and then for your fans and your alumni base that travel to the game, I think it's a great reward and an opportunity for them to, to see their team play in a little bit of a different venue against maybe a team that you don't play every year. You know, certainly in this case, a team we used to play every year, but not anymore. And right. not since 2003, I guess what you said. You know, so I think you, you want to enjoy the, the bowl experience, but at the same time, you don't have to look any further than the, the game last weekend that Arizona played in where they come back and they win the game and you see those guys on the stage at the end of the game holding the trophy up and how excited they are to do that. And we know what that feels like. We've done that five times in a row here at Rutgers and, and our players know what that feels like. And that's what you're competing for. You're competing for the opportunity to win a championship and call yourself not just a bowl participant, but the, the Russell Athletic Bowl champions. And you put that on the ring and you get the trophy and it goes in your trophy case. And, and those are, are memories that last a lifetime and, and things that our players really look forward to competing for. And as you know, you just told me before, there's not a lot of events for the team to get around. And, you know, basically you have to be there, having to be there. Do you like that as a coach more? Not having to be there, giving them more time off to be able to go off and, you know, just enjoy their trip. Yeah, I think every bowl game has been a little different in that aspect. And mm -hmm. in this trip, there's really one organized team event to a children's hospital that I think will be a great trip for our players. I think it'll be a great experience and something that they'll never forget and a way for us to give back a little bit for the reward of going to a game like this. And then they're going to have some free time and, and there's going to be a lot of things, a lot of different things for them to do. So the different players on the team, whatever their interests are, they'll, they'll have opportunities to do that. But I think the, the real secret to success comes in the ability to separate when it's time to work, it's time to work. And then when your work is done on the football field and in the meeting rooms for the day, now the rest of the day is, is for you to enjoy, and then you come back the next day ready to work again. Coach, we'll see you in Orlando. I am looking forward to it. Russell Athletic Bowl coming up on the 28th of December. That is a week from Friday when Rutgers will play Virginia Tech at 530. For all your bowl information, go to RutgersBowl.com. Ticket packages, travel packages, Make sure you get down to Orlando. Beautiful to get into the sun for a few days. It's our final show at Brother Jimmy's, so we have a few people to thank. Jason Baum and Patrick Crawford from the Sports Information Office. Tim DeMartin, Colin Osborne doing a great job for us on our vision all year. Paul Schrager, 
our engineer, Mike Lawrence and Noah Fleischman back at the WCTC studios in the WOR in New York as well. So we certainly appreciate that. Eric, it's been a lot of fun this year, my sure friend. Has. I'll be back next next week, even though there might there won't be a show down here. So I'll be back enjoying these French fries. I'll like it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope to see everybody down in Orlando next week. Have a great holiday season. Merry Christmas, everybody. And we'll see you at the Russell Athletic Bowl on December the 28th. Flood Show, the weekly hour-long program with the Rutgers head football coach, has been a sports presentation of the New Talk Radio 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com, the voice of the Scarlet Knights.